You're listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, visit nakedbiblepodcast.com and click on the support link in the upper right hand corner. If you're new to the podcast and Dr. Hyde's approach to the Bible, click on New Start Here at nakedbiblepodcast.com. Welcome to the Naked Bible Podcast, episode 266, Exodus 5 and 6. I'm the layman, Trey Strickland, and he's the scholar, Dr. Michael Heiser. Hey, Mike, how you doing this week? Pretty good. I'm ready to use this episode to vault us ahead in Exodus, make up for some lost time. Two chapters today, so that's uh, yep. that's good. Yep. And that's partly due, you know, some of the things in these two chapters we've actually touched on before, and then there's a couple of new things. So. We're not cheating. It just worked out this way. Well, I do, I, I've seen people uh, comments uh, online about uh, how far in the weeds, you know, we've gone, you've gone so far uh, in Exodus. So I can't tell if they, if that's a good thing or bad thing, but I think it's a good thing. Yeah. They might want to tie a rope around my, my <laughs> ankle or waist or something. Back. <laughs> it's like that uh, right. <laughs> uh, poltergeist movie. You've seen that movie? They tie our waist. They dive yeah, in to get Caroline. You got to pull them back. Yeah. yeah. There you go. Yeah. Yeah, that's kind of what it feels like half the time. But yeah, well, I don't know. I, I'm I'm in agreement with the uh, the comments, and I don't know if it's good or bad. But you know, <laughs> what hey, can I, you do? hey, I think it's good. I think it's good. So uh, we're just going to classify it as good. How's Norman? You're uh, home with he's the a puns. psycho. <laughs> he's <laughs> just a psycho. a psycho. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, aptly named. Yeah, you know, more he's like the perfect pug. You know, he just pug loafs all over the place. He's he's basically unconscious most of the day and he just wants to sit with you but norman is just climbing the walls man so he's he's still a puppy you know eight months so maybe uh maybe maybe he'll grow out of that lord will <laughs> well, all right Mike. Oh. all right well, let's Mike. jump into uh yeah to exodus five and six um we're gonna be uh, you know, we're gonna go through both chapters and we're, we're gonna make some observations here and there in the chapters, you know, landing on subject matter that we've, we've tracked on before, like I mentioned a few moments ago. And then there's going to be one particular new item that is, I think, kind of in the sweet spot here of interest, you know, for this audience, you know, how the content here relates specifically to Egyptology and you know, ancient Egypt. But let's just jump in. We, we can start here at, in chapter five, uh, first verse afterward, Moses and Aaron went and said to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, let my people go that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. But Pharaoh said, who is the Lord? And again, Lord is in all small caps there. So it's who is Yahweh that I should obey his voice and let Israel go. I do not know Yahweh. And moreover, I will not let Israel go. If you look at what Pharaoh says here, who's Yahweh that I should obey his voice? This is precisely what someone who thinks himself a deity would say. <laughs> so, so right off the bat, you know, you, you, the the whole confrontation, you know, is really portrayed not just between a king and you know some some guys, you know, showing up out of the desert, uh, and, and you know, it's it's not going to be a debate or, or some sort of power struggle that that's sort of only operative, you know, on, on the human plane. You have. A person, Pharaoh, who considers himself Horus incarnate, and so does everybody else that's listening, being challenged by a couple of hicks, all right, you know, from Midian or, you know, from right there in in, in Egypt, you know, among a a servant, you know, indentured servant population, challenging Pharaoh's authority and really his his status as, as deity, the one who controls and maintains order in Egypt. You know, Pharaoh. We talked about this earlier in other episodes, as the incarnate Horus was the one who maintains the divinely dictated ma'at, which is an Egyptian word for order, your cosmic order, the way things are supposed to be. Uh, Pharaoh is the central figure in maintaining that as, as the incarnate Horus. And so now we're confronted by this other deity, Yahweh, and the incarnate Horus says, well, who's that? I mean, so it, it takes on a whole different flavor right from the get-go. And again, ancient readers, and of course the writer, would have would have known this. I mean, they're they're going to see through this because they know you know what what the Egyptians think of Pharaoh. They know what Pharaoh thinks of himself, and so on and so forth. So this is exactly again what somebody who thinks himself a deity would say. 
and everything just sort of takes off from there. Now, the next verse says, then they said, Moses and Aaron, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. Please let us go a three days journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword. Now, this is going to take us on a bit of a rabbit trail again, but a rabbit trail that we've been on many times, and that is the whole Sinai location thing again. So there's another problem here in this verse for both the traditional Sinai location, that's Jebel El, Jebel Musa, you know, in the, uh, in the V down there in the south, in the V between the forks of the Red Sea. And it, it's also a problem for the Jebel El Laws location in Midian. And I might add, it's also a problem for Sinai in Edom and Seir, Paran, Timon area, you know, that, that I've spent a lot of time talking about. And we've, we've been through a number of passages, you know, that, that link Sinai and, and, you know, Yahweh's march from the south to this area. Exodus 5.3 is a problem for all of them. And I've mentioned before that, you know, ultimately the real answer to where, what the location of Sinai is, is nobody really knows. And, and there are problems, you know, with, with all the options. There just are. Now, you say, well, what's the problem here? Let me read it again. Then they said, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. Please let us go a three days journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. Three days. So the question is, from where the Hebrews are living in Egypt, the Eastern Delta, how far can you get in three days? Well, I'll let you ponder that. And I'm going to take you back to Exodus 3, because this isn't a throwaway line, let us go three days. It shows up in other passages. It's to be taken seriously. So if you go back to Exodus 3, 14 through 18, again, this is the revelation of the divine name. We read this. God said to Moses, you know, this is after Moses says, well, who should I say sent me? You know, God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. Thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac and of Jacob has appeared to me saying, I have observed you and what has been done to you in Egypt. And I promise that I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt to the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Parasites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, a land flowing with milk and honey. And they will listen to your voice. And you and the elders of Israel shall go to the king of Egypt, which is what is happening in chapter 5. You will go to the king of Egypt and say to him, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us. And now, please, let us go a three days journey into the wilderness, that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. That's exactly what they say here. Exodus 5, 3, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. Please let us go a three days journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. We see it again in Exodus chapter 8. Okay, this is a little bit later in the drama. Exodus 8, 25 through 27. Then Pharaoh called Moses and Aaron. You know, this is after you know, he's getting hit with some plagues here. He calls Moses and Aaron and said, go, get out of here. You know, sacrifice to, the, to your God within the land. But Moses said, it would not be right to do so, for the offerings we shall sacrifice to the Lord our God are an abomination to the Egyptians. If we sacrifice offerings abominable to the Egyptians before their eyes, will they not stone us? Verse 27, we must go three days journey into the wilderness and sacrifice to the Lord our God as he tells us. So here's the issue. Either God, who gave them this direction in the first place at the burning bush, Either God meant for them to go three days into the wilderness and do this sacrificing, or he didn't, because they did not mishear him. They repeat what God said. The verb of sacrifice used in all of these passages I just read is the same. Now, guess where we see the Israelites offering sacrifice? Again, the very same verb. To the Lord, 
as a newly redeemed people. Guess where we see that? That's correct, at Mount Sinai. Exodus 24, 5. He, Moses, sent young men of the people of Israel who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen to the Lord. Moses took half the blood, put it in the basins, half the blood he threw against the altar. I mean, this is the, 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 the Sinai covenant ceremony. This is what they actually do. Now, here's the question. If they're doing this at Sinai, and we take the words that we've read at once from God's mouth himself at the burning bush, if we take those words seriously, then the location of Sinai must be three days' journey from where they leave in Egypt. You cannot get to Jebel Musa, the traditional Sinai site, in three days. You can't get to Jebel El Laz, which is on the east side of the Gulf of Aqaba, in three days. You just can't do it. It can't work. Now, you might be able to get to Kadesh Barnea in three days. And I mentioned Kadesh Barnea because, you know, after the uh, the episode, we, the episodes, excuse me, we did on the Sinai location. I posted something on my website, you know, just with a little more detail for, again, to explain to people why I I don't hold the traditional view and why I, I abandon the Jebel Allah's view. And there, there's a, an incident in Exodus 17 that links Kadesh Barnea with, you know, the splitting of the rock and Rephidim and the, and the location of Sinai. But it, and that's that's right adjacent to Seir and Timon and Paran. So there's something going on. These events are going on in this area, this area south of Canaan, north of the Gulf of Aqaba, and also north of the Negev. So this is where the Sinai stuff is happening. It's not happening at the traditional site. It's not happening over at the Jebel el site. And Kadesh, Kadesh Barnea, I mean, there are different names, you know, that, that are used of the same location, and there are different names that are used, uh, you know, to connecting this with Horeb and Sinai. You, you can go up to the website and read the stuff, you know, all the detail. So if, if we're looking at the Kadesh Barnea area, which would be the, the closest part of this region where all this stuff is happening to Egypt, you might be able, if you really, really hustle, you might be able to get there in three days. But, but it's, it's kind of doubtful. So there's even a problem with this. Plus, you have other textual problems when, as it relates to what's going on. We have a statement in Deuteronomy 1-2 that it's 11 days' journey from Horeb, from Horeb by the way of Mount Seir to Kadesh Barnea. Now, we know from our pr- previous episodes that there are certain passages that link, that take the name Horeb and associate it with Mount Sinai. But there are other verses that take Horeb, and, and it's not a specific mountain. It, it's, it's an area, a mountainous area. So how do we take Deuteronomy 1, 2 there? And how does it relate to this three days thing that we just read three times? Again, the first of which is, comes right from the mouth of God of the burning bush. Three days journey. How do we relate that to this 11-day thing you know, in Deuteronomy 1, 2? You also have Deuteronomy 1, 19. Then we set out from Horeb. Again, is it a mountain, a specific mountain, or a mountainous area? Then we set out from Horeb and went through all that great and terrifying wilderness that you saw on the way to the hill country of the Amorites, as the Lord our God commanded us. And we came to Kadesh Barnea. So this has to be a regional thing because it's disconnected, but, but still in relation to Kadesh Barnea. How do we take that? And worst of all, how do we take Numbers 33? In Numbers 33, you have this long itinerary of the journey from Egypt, you know, to, to Sinai and, and into the wilderness, okay? Numbers 33 has multiple stations between the term Sinai and Horeb and Kadesh. Now, that seemingly requires ignoring passages that link Sinai and Kadesh, but you can't just do that and have a coherent, inerrant view of the itinerary. Now, the problems here that I'm describing may be lessened by creating the more legitimate distinction between Horeb and Sinai. Again, sometimes it's a mountain, sometimes it's not. Again, it could be just a generic reference to a desert wilderness. You you might, I mean, that's going to help. It's going to contribute, you know, to how you unravel, untangle, and then put back together all of this stuff. You've got these these three-day 
you know, verses. You've got the 11 day verse in Deuteronomy. You know, you've, you've got where is Horeb and Sinai? Are they the same or are they different? You know, what about all these stages in Numbers 33? Now, when we get to the actual root of the Exodus, you're going to see that Numbers 33 presents a, a few problems, a few additional problems. You know, my, my point with all this is that it is not possible. It is not possible to be certain about the location of Mount Sinai. It just isn't. I'm telling you the truth. This is what we do here. I'm telling you like it is. And if you're taking the three days thing seriously, and I, I would suggest we do that because that's what God tells them at the burning bush, you cannot get to Jebel Musa in three days. You cannot get to Jebel Allah's in three days. Now, there is a, a location we have not even talked about that is adjacent to the Kadesh Barnea area. And, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's a little bit west of that. And it's, it's more west of Edom and Seir and Paran and all that stuff. So, again, how, how does all this go together? And that other location is Har Karkom. And there are some scholars who park on Har Karkom uh, as being Mount Sinai for this very reason, the three-day journey thing. You know, plus the Kadesh and the, and the march from the south stuff, that, that gets factored in. But all of those views, even, even that alternative view, you know, and some other view that isn't Jebel Musa or Jebel Allahs, all of that, any alternative view has to figure out what to do with these chronological statements and, and these number of days statements. And I'm just telling you the truth. Nobody knows precisely where this was. There are certain, about the best you can do is say, look, there are certain options. And again, it, for, for me, it's the traditional site and Jebel Allah's. Even though I used to hold the Jebel Allah's view when I started running into this stuff, I had to abandon it. And again, the, the march from the south is a big deal for me and the three-day journey. I mean, I, have, I didn't even mention that on the earlier podcast, but here, here it is because this is, you know, it, it comes up here in the confrontation, which is the context of the Exodus 3 statement. This is a big deal. You just can't get to those locations in three days. They didn't have cars, okay? <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, they, you, you can't do it. And, and in our earlier episodes about Sinai, about the 11-day thing, you know, I postulate, because I do think it makes more sense than what Graham Davies is saying about this is 11 consecutive days in one direction. I, you know, I just don't buy that. There's nothing in the text that requires that. And, and he's trying to do math about how long it, you know how how much you know territory can be discovered by adult males and, and soldiers and stuff like that, or just normal adult males in a day. Look, you're not dealing with adult males here. Half of your population is women and children, and then livestock. So it, this is why even the three days to to you know, Har Karkom, that's a huge undertaking. Even that's a stretch, because the the travel is going to be slow. You know, because of, of, of who's on the who's taking the trip. These are not just adult males. And not everybody can ride a camel. Okay. You know, it, you're gonna most of the people are gonna be walking. The, I mean, these are significant issues, and nobody has really produced a coherent, satisfactory explanation for how to take all these things, put them together, and come out at a lo- at a coherent location that works especially with the three days verse, but works with some of these other indicators. Nobody knows. The Jebel Musa site is nothing more than church tradition. That's what it is. Constantine's mom, you know, this is the site. Okay, that's the site. Uh, Again, it it might be workable in, in many respects, but you're not getting there in three days. And according to Exodus 24, that is where Israel offers sacrifice to the Lord as the Lord told them to do. So either the three days thing is wrong or the Exodus 24 thing is wrong. Take your pick. This is what you're up against when it comes to this kind of, of, of data. You don't get to articulate a view. You know, and, and again, I accuse the scholarly community of this with the traditional date. I, it's one of those things that rarely gets examined. You know, I, if, if, I, if I was at an academic meeting, I'd say, Tell me how you get to Jebel Musa in three days. Now, what they're going to tell you if, if you're at SBL or 
ASOR. Oh, it's just wrong. The three days is wrong. It's just, you know, we can't take that at face value. Well, thanks. That really solves the problem. You know, that, that's the kind of thing that scholars get to do. They just get to say to the stuff that's in their way, it's just not, it's not accurate. <laughs> you know? uh, I, I don't think that we just get to, to do that willy nilly. All right. That, that, that's just, that's really suspicious to me. That, that's cheating. And so any view held by anyone has got to take these things seriously and, and work them out. And good luck. You know, here, here we are again. We're, we're, we're back to the, whole, to the whole sign. I think this is not easy. And again, my view is nobody, nobody's right here. Nobody really, really knows. And again, I, I haven't come across a, a really good explanation. And, and to be honest with you, I'm not going to noodle it to do it because I'm just not that interested in it. I don't really want to spend my life or, you know, for, or 10 years of my life, whatever it would take, kind of like the authorship of the book of Hebrews. Like at the end of the day, you know, okay, I'll assume there's a solution out there, but, but in, in that five or 10 years it would take me to figure this out, I could have produced a whole lot of stuff that's really useful. This is not as useful. It is not as good of a use of my limited time because someday I'm going to die. And I don't want you know to have devoted my life to this question or questions like the authorship of the Book of Hebrews. I keep poking fun at that. But that's kind of like an inside academic joke, you know, for the the, the scholar who sort of drove himself insane. What was he trying to figure out who wrote Hebrews? Yeah. Um, they're just better things to do. They 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 just are. Uh, but I want I want you again to be disabused of the notion that this has been solved. It hasn't. Let's go on in chapter five here before we spend too much of this time on this subject, you get from verse 4 to 23, the rest of the confrontation, you know, with Pharaoh. And this is the bricks and straw episode, uh, you know, where, where Pharaoh says, hey, you know, you, you must have a lot of time here. Or your people have a lot of time on your hands. You know, you, you're wasting my time. You're wasting their time with these meetings. You know, he says in verse 5, the people of the land are now many. You make them rest from their burdens, you know, by all this brickety brack. So he commands, you know, the taskmasters of the people and their foremen, you shall no longer give people straw to make bricks. As in the past, let them go and gather straw themselves. You know, we're familiar with this scene and what happens. You know, this, this increases the burden of, uh, you know, of the Israelites. And they complain to Moses and Aaron and, and, you know, about what they're doing. This is a very straightforward account here. And I only want to mention uh, John Currid, who's a, a trained Egyptologist, and he's an Old Testament guy as well. Um, I mentioned his his book, Egypt in the Old Testament, before. He's also written a commentary on the first eighteen volumes. He may have he may have both volumes done now, but uh, on this uh, a study commentary on Exodus. And just a little note here, and he throws in he he says a famous brick making scene is pictured on the walls of the Rech Mirah Chapel in Thebes, dating to the middle of the fifteenth century B.C. So this is the fourteen hundreds B.C. It illustrates the process of brick making in Egypt, and what is demonstrated there fits well with the biblical description of Exodus five, and it does. Um, we'll, we'll have pictures of of those those tomb wall paintings on the episode site for this episode, and you can see again they're they're making bricks in the picture, and you know, they're they're you know cutting straw in the picture. I mean, it, it, this is a very coherent, historically on target description of how bricks were made. And, and again, we, we all know this story, so we're going to move on from, from this because it's, it's very straightforward. But you should just know that this is one of those good touch points uh, in the Exodus narrative that, you know, this is how they did it. And, you know, the, the evidence, the not photographic, obviously, but the pictorial evidence uh, from Egypt aligns very nicely here. When we get into Exodus 6, again, after this episode with the bricks and the straw, then we have, you know, the confrontation gets ramped up a little bit. Exodus 6, the Lord said to Moses, now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. Okay, so, you know, Pharaoh makes makes the task harder. The people complain, you know, Moses is like, you know, at, at the end of the chapter 5, you know, Lord, why have you done this to the people? Why did you ever send me, you know, blah, yeah, I was right, they're not going to listen, you know, this whole thing. But the Lord says to Moses, now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. For with a strong hand, he will send them out. 
and with a strong hand, he will drive them out of his land. In other words, Pharaoh's going to be glad to get rid of you by the time I'm done with Pharaoh. He will be thrilled to see you go. God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, okay, as God Almighty. But by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself known to them. Again, this is, we, we've, we're going we're to come back, you know, to, to Exodus 6.3. And we've already mentioned Exodus 3, or 6.3 before, uh, when it comes to uh, the whole, you know, the Kenite hypothesis and all that sort of thing. Uh, this verse does not need to be translated uh, specifically the way most translations have it. Because, you know, critics, you know, they, they typically like to refer to this verse um, again, to say that they didn't know who Yahweh was. Not only did they not know, you know, who who Yahweh was, but you know, we've got uh, a situation where they're they're not worshiping Yahweh. This is all entirely new, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, critics again will, will will sort of pounce on this. This is a big sort of go-to passage to justify all of JEDP and and that sort of thing. But what we really need to, you know, realize here is that this verse, and I'm going to read it to you again, I am the Lord. Okay, that's the end of verse two. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty, but by my name, the Lord, by my name, Yahweh, I did not make myself known to them. And that makes it sound like the patriarchs had never heard of, of the name Yahweh because of the way this verse is translated. Now, you could go up and Google this, uh, but I'm just going to read a little section to you. I, I blogged a long time ago. I, I had a, an online review of the Zondervan uh, Illustrated Bible Background Commentary, uh, the, the first volume there of uh, you know, the, the Torah. And I, I left a few notes there about Exodus. And this is one of the things I, I, I sort of nitpicked with the, with the resource. I, I like the series. I mean, don't get me wrong. The series is really good. But the editor, who's, who's Bruce Wells, who's a good guy, but I, I wrote here, Wells fails to note that there is a substantive disagreement on the accepted translation. Now, I'll, I'll stop there and say it's not a well-known disagreement, but it is substantive. It's for real. Even though you'll, you, you won't have scholars who, who use the verse to promote JEDP or scholars who use the verse to promote the notion that um, Yahweh's name and his worship was entirely foreign to the patriarchs. Th- those people who are already in that camp, They'll they'll never, you know, introduce you to what I'm about to say, you know, in relation to Francis Anderson, who is a very well known both in critical circles and in, in Christian circles. You know, he I, I think he's still alive. This is the Anderson of the Anderson Forbes database. Uh, Frank is in his 90s. He lives in Australia. If he's still with us, um, but a, a very very widely published widely respected Hebrew scholar. He wrote a book called The Sentence in Biblical Hebrew. Doesn't that sound exciting? On syntactical grounds, Anderson argues for a translation that is basically opposite in its meaning to the accepted view or or the most common translation, like, like what I just read to you out of the ESV. Here's how Anderson argues in this book. And this is an obscure book. It's not a book for anybody who doesn't know Hebrew and Hebrew syntax well. Uh, again, it's, this is an academic scholarly publication, but Anderson argues for a translation that's basically opposite. Here's how he translates this verse. At the end of verse 2, I am the Lord, I am Yahweh. I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as El Shaddai, and my name is Yahweh. Did I not make myself known to them? It, 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 it's, it's 180 degrees away from the way Exodus 6.3 is usually translated. And again, for technical reasons, if you're, if, if you're into Hebrew, I would recommend get Anderson's book. You will very seldom, unfortunately, you will, you will very seldom read any interaction with Anderson's book on this verse. I would, I would venture to guess that, that it's, it's either ignored by critical scholars, they don't care, or they, they just don't know about it. And, and the reason I, I, I wonder about it is there's a, there's a very lengthy uh, JBL, Journal of Biblical Literature, article uh, by R- uh, Randall Garr, who's an expert in Semitic philology and Semitic grammar on Exodus 6.3, and he never footnotes or even mentions Anderson's book. Not once. 
Now, to me, that's either a huge oversight or it's an, a thing that just gets in the way. And so we're not going to include it. I don't know which, what's the explanation there, but he doesn't mention it once. So you, my audience, should know that this is not a given. The translation of this verse is not a given. And so if this is ever whipped out at you for you know whatever reason, I mean, you all know that I don't buy the JEDP view, but I also don't buy the, like, everything's Moses view. Uh, I'm, I think editing is very obvious in the Torah. I think multiple hands are very obvious in the Torah. So I'm, I'm not either one of those. And I'm just telling you that this verse is not the load of ammunition that the died in the world JEDPers make it to be. It just isn't. So well, let's move on from that and I'll focus on what I really want to get into here for the rest of our time. And that is the motif that's going to be, you know, it, it's, it's come up here, the strong hand, the strong arm, okay, that kind of phrasing that you know the, so those and similar phrases are what I want to focus on here you go down into Exodus 6 in verse 6 say therefore to the people of Israel I am the Lord and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians I will deliver you from slavery to them I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment I will take you to be my people, and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God, who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will bring you into the land that I swore to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to you for a possession. I am the Lord. How many times does he have to say that? Isn't it interesting? I am Yahweh. It's an assertion of authority. Moses spoke thus to the people of Israel, but they didn't listen to Moses because of their broken spirit and harsh slavery. So God is going to you know, send him back to Pharaoh. Go tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to let the people go out of this land. But Moses said to the Lord, Behold, the people of Israel haven't listened to me. How's, how's Pharaoh going to listen to me? For I am a, of uncircumcised lips. So here we go again. Moses is making excuses, excuses about being able to deliver the message. Verse 13, But the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron. Here we go again. We've mentioned this before. Aaron keeps coming back into the picture. He is the concession to Moses. And he gave them a charge about the people of Israel and about Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to bring the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt. And, you know, the rest of the scene unfolds. Now, what I want to focus on here are the phrases strong hand and outstretched arm. I'm going to reference uh, James Hoffmeyer here. Now, I've already mentioned Hoffmeyer's book on uh, Israel and Egypt. I, re- I mentioned, I can't remember what the specific article was on, something about um, Oh, I can't remember. It was Pitham and Ramses or something like that. This is a different article, uh, and it's specifically on this topic. So I'm going to, what you're going to hear from this point on is drawn from Hoffmeyer's article entitled The Arm of God versus the Arm of Pharaoh in the Exodus Narratives. It's from the journal Biblica, volume 67, number 3, 1986, pages 378 through 387. Now, Hoffmeyer, again, has his PhD from Toronto in Egyptology. He knows the Egyptian material very well. He teaches at Wheaton now, where he has for a number of years. He was at TED's before that. But he writes this, The Exodus traditions assert that Israel attained her liberation from Egypt by God's agency, symbolized by his victorious conquering arm, There are several expressions used to describe the victorious arm, but two stand out as being the most frequently occurring, being strong hand, it's in Exodus 3.19, Exodus 13, verses 3, 14, and 16, Exodus 32.11, and then there's a series of uh, references in Deuteronomy, again, referencing, looking back at at the events here. And then outstretched arm occurs in Exodus 6.6, we just read that. Deuteronomy 9.29, Deuteronomy 26.8, again, looking back you know, at these things. Hoffmeyer says, now both expressions are used in parallelism, parallel with each other, in Deuteronomy 4.34 and Deuteronomy 5.15 and Deuteronomy 7.19. So we know that they are synonymous expressions. No, that's not a point of speculation, that's for sure. Hoffmeyer adds, hand and arm both mean hand or arm, like it can mean that literally, but metaphorically, they mean power and strength. It is well recognized that the language of the Exodus narrative is connected with the motif of Yahweh as the divine warrior. 
So this militaristic imagery should not be surprising. Placing the origins of the conquering arm motif in the Exodus makes especially good sense once the Egyptian concepts surrounding Pharaoh as a warrior are examined. Pharaoh was Horus incarnate. Horus, of course, fought against Seth in the pyramid texts. Let me just break in here. Uh, in, in, in Egyptian uh, mythology about you know, how Egypt came to be, uh, Horus and Seth, you know, battled to that. Uh, this is this is the the sort of religious um, framework. So there were two lands in Egypt. There's an Upper Egypt and a Lower Egypt, and they, in the beginning of Egyptian dynastic history, they were separate, and then uh, you know they get they get unified militarily, and you know part of the framework for that is this Horus and Seth fight. And then the pharaoh, you know, it, it becomes the incarnate Horus. And he, he's the great warrior is the point. Now back to Hofmeier. Starting with the scenes of the monarchs of dynasties five and six, such as Sahura, Niu, Niusera, Jed, Kara, and Pepi. Inscriptions are included which say, quote, the great god who strikes Asiatics. Asiatics are Semitic people in, uh, in Egyptian thought. We see the king defeating his foes with his conquering arm, even though no direct, direct reference is made to the arm. But later, Hofmeier, we're skipping around at Hofmeier here. Later, he says, it is not until the Middle Kingdom, which is 1970 to 1800 BC, that we begin to see expressions related to the conquering arm of Pharaoh appearing. Of particular interest is the term kapesh, which means arm or power. And it's found beginning in the 12th dynasty and continues with even greater frequency into the new kingdom. Kepesh means to, or begins to appear in royal titles and names in the Hyksos period. The Hyksos king Apophis bears the prenomen Neb Kepesh Ra, which translates Ra is lord or possessor of a strong arm. This is one of the names of, of that particular pharaoh. Remember, we mentioned this earlier when we were talking about chronology. The pharaohs had five names. There was a five-fold titulary. And so Hofmeyer is pointing out that you know, you're know you going to get certain pharaohs that one of their names has has this kepesh in it, this, this reference to a strong arm. And it, it, it's, it's metaphorical, again, for a, a militaristic you know, leader. Back to Hofmeyer. As might be expected, the use of kepesh on royal titles reaches its zenith during the days of the military-minded Tutmosid and Ramesside kings of the 18th and 19th dynasties. Hofmeyer then goes on uh, in, in his article, he goes through a series of examples. He goes through Egyptian texts you know, where you have an outstretched arm, a you know, strong arm, strong arm in hand, all this kind of stuff in, in Egyptian texts associated with the portrait of Pharaoh. Again, the incarnate Horus as a great warrior. Back to him more specifically, later in his article, he says, our second and third observations have to do with why the biblical writers chose to use the expressions strong hand and outstretched arm. The foregoing references, again, that he lists out in his article, illustrate that the pharaohs, especially those of the new kingdom, again, interjecting, which is when all the Exodus stuff's happening by either the early or late date, especially those of the new kingdom, those pharaohs recognized that their power to conquer, subdue, hunt, etc., was linked to their mighty arms. One cannot help but wonder if the biblical writers were not consciously using expressions like strong hand and outstretched arm polemically against the Egyptian concepts that were embodied in pharaoh. The Song of the Sea in Exodus 15 has been called Israel's victory or triumph hymn. That's the one where who is like you among the gods. Again, and, and there, there are things in there, again, that are going to strike at Pharaoh's status. Because who is like you among the gods? Well, Pharaoh's included in that. And Pharaoh just got his butt kicked, okay, at the crossing of the Red Sea. You know, the Lord, you know, Yahweh delivered his people with a strong hand or a strong arm or an outstretched arm. So Hofmeyer is wondering, you know, on, on paper, hey, I wonder, you know, if the biblical writers were doing this on purpose, you know, is, is it a poke in the eye to Pharaoh? I, again, Hofmeyer is going to say, yeah, it was, and I, I would agree with him. Uh, back to Hofmeyer again, he says, Yahweh demonstrated his legitimacy as the greatest God 
by his arm defeating that of Pharaoh. Again, this language, again, would have been a direct confrontation to Pharaoh's status as a deity incarnate who is the greatest military power. Hoffmeyer writes, the Hebrew prophets recognized that the consequences of the clash between God and Pharaoh meant that Yahweh was superior to all gods. What better way for the Exodus traditions to describe God's victory over Pharaoh and as a result of his superiority than to use the Hebrew derivations or Hebrew counterparts to Egyptian expressions that symbolized Egyptian royal power? And that's the end of, of what I want to give you from Hofmeyer. But I think he's I think he's spot on here. You know, for a biblical writer to use these phrases uh, again, yeah, they're they're found elsewhere in the Hebrew Bible, but specifically here in Exodus. You know, you get several of them, and then you get you get the, the same language again in, in other passages that harken back to the Exodus event in some way. That's not a coincidence. That is the biblical writer digging, poking. Not only Pharaoh in the eye, but but the Egyptians in the eye, and then as as other Semitic people, because I mean Egypt Egyptians a powerful civilization for a long time, and lots of people in Canaan, like the with the El Amarna texts are evidence of this. The Egyptians are running things in Canaan for a long time. They're going to be familiar. Semitic people are going to be familiar with these expressions. And so when they hear the Hebrews talking in these terms, or when they read Hebrew texts talking in these terms, they know exactly what's going on. This is a dig. This is a diss. This is a, a, a swipe at Pharaoh, specifically. Uh, so it, it, it's just not coincidental. It, it's a good you know, literary you know, uh, intersection you know, between Egypt and the Hebrew Bible. Now, if you keep reading verses 14 through 26 in Exodus 6, you have this intrusive genealogy, which we we mentioned when we talked about uh, the Aaronic you know, concession, you know, the, the priesthood of Aaron. So this is when you get, at this point you know, in, in the story, you, you get this weird genealogy just sort of dropped in here. Like, boy, that's in the way. You know, what's that doing there? And we talked about that before, so I'm not going to rehearse kind of all of its purposes. But again, it's it's to remind you know readers that that Aaron's in the picture now, both Moses and Aaron's the same Moses and Aaron that did this, that, and the other thing. Uh, again, to 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 sort of make it clear that our only leader is not Moses; it's Moses and Aaron. We've got two now instead of one, uh, and, and it, it, it contributes to the elevation of the Aaronic priesthood, obviously, which wasn't the original plan. Again, had Moses never complained at the burning bush. There would have been no need to bring Aaron into the picture, is the point. But since that did happen, here's another reminder of you know who's who's who. Now Sarna comments, this is Sarna in his Exodus commentary about the genealogy. He says this. A detailed analysis of the content of the genealogy discloses careful design and purpose. The line of the Levites is framed by a separate introduction and conclusion. That's verses 16 and 26. The lifespans of individuals are registered only in the list of Levites, verses 16, 18, and 20. And the descendants of Levi are traced to five generations in contrast to the single generation given for the Reubenites and the Simeonites. Still more peculiarities appear in the Levitical listing. Aaron's name precedes that of Moses, verse 20. Moses' wife is not mentioned, but Aaron's is, verse 23. Only the fathers-in-law of Aaron and his son Eliezer are named, verses 23 through 25. Only Aaron's brother-in-law is recorded. Only Aaron's descendants and not those of Moses are listed, and to three generations. To put it all another way, the Levites are here singled out from among the other tribes of Israel. The Aaronides are distinguished from among the other Levitical families, and there is a further differentiation within the Aaronide families themselves. These special features undoubtedly anticipate later developments, the special status to be granted to the tribe of Levi, the appointment of the Aaronides to serve as priests, the investment of Aaron as high priest, with one specific line of his descendants exclusively designated to succeed him. The exaltation of Aaron is enhanced even further by the note about his marriage in verse 23. His brother-in-law, Nashon, and also presumably his father-in-law, Aminadab, 
was a chieftain of the tribe of Judah and an ancestor of King David. That's the end of the Sarna quote. So there, there's, again, genealogies on the surface are pretty boring, but they, there's a lot of stuff. That they're kind of like congressional bills. You know, There's a lot of stuff that's just snuck into them. And if anybody reads them closely, you'll find that stuff out. Um, this is very clearly designed to bring Aaron uh, and his line and the Levites on par uh, with Moses. And again, that's why it harkens back to the whole concession narrative. Now, just a few isolated observations within the, the genealogy. When you go down to verse 20, we have this mentioned. Uh, we have the mention of, of Amram and, and Jochebed, you know, Moses' parents. So he, it says, Amram took his, as his wife, Jochebed, his father's sister, or Yochebed, would be the, the better Hebraic pronunciation. Amram took his wife, Yochebed, his father's sister, and she bore him Aaron and Moses, the years of the life of Amram being 137 years. Now, a couple of notes here. The line about his father's sister, marriage to a paternal aunt, is prohibited in Leviticus 18.12 and 20.19. Therefore, the present notice, Sarna says, must preserve a very ancient tradition. Now, again, we're, we're not going to get into all the authorship issues, but if you're thinking that Moses, after the fact, is writing all of the Torah, why would he put that line in there? Why would he have Aaron, his Aaron, or why would he have their parents, both the parents of him and Aaron, why would he have his mother and father's marriage be delegitimized by Mosaic law if, if Moses is the author? There, there's things like this that come up, you know, as opposed to somebody. And it could have been Moses. It could have been an, a more ancient tradition. I mean, Sarna, that, sure. There could have been something around, you know, oral tradition or whatever, you know, that, that, that predates, you know, the, the codification, you know, the literary product, you know, of Leviticus and the Torah and whatnot. But again, it's still a question. Why would you do that? Why would you do that? This is the kind of thing that scholars fixate on when it comes to authorship issues, because they read the text really closely. And they'll ask questions like this. Well, does this make sense, you know, for Moses to have done or somebody else? You know, it's just that kind of thing. And again, I'm not going to drill down into this, you know, into the nuts and bolts of all these things, um, because it, it just it gets almost as bad as chronology. It gets really granular, it gets you into theories about sources and all this kind of stuff. And that just doesn't translate well to audio. And, and honestly, it, it gets mind numbing, you know, after a while. But I, I mentioned things like this again, just to reinforce that the reality uh, to you that a lot of what scholars say, even critical scholars, again, who don't have any theological investment in the Bible, like they don't believe in concepts like inspiration or inerrancy, but a lot of the stuff they, they talk about and the questions they raise derive from the text. They're not just sitting in their, in their rooms, you know, in their, their little faculty you know, offices or something, you know, what can I do today to, you know, to hate on evangelicals? Now, they don't have to invent things, okay? They, these are things that just they, you just bump into in the text, and they create questions, and then you know, scholars have to, have to try to figure these things out. And sometimes you can, sometimes you, you can't, sometimes you just come up with a working theory, and that, you know, that, that's as far as you can go. That's what scholars do. So it's not all like just made-up stuff. There, there's real stuff like this. Now, Yochaved is interesting, Moses' mother's name. She is the anonymous Levite woman of Exodus 2.1, you know, way back in the Moses you know, story. Uh, a man from the house of Levi went and took as his wife a Levite woman, and they have this baby called Moses, okay, who, who gets named Moses. This is the anonymous woman. She's the first biblical person to bear a name composed of Yo, which is the shortened form, one of the shortened forms, of the divine name, you know, YHWH. Her name means, or seems to mean, Yahweh is glory. Okay, Yo is the divine element, and then Kavad is a is a, a noun. It can be a noun that means glory. Now, here's another author question: the writer or editor creates the impression that the divine name, short form Yo, yo here Y W, and without getting into historical Semitic linguistics as to why that was pronounced Yo, just again. I'll say, take my word for it, or I can give you references for it. <laughs> the writer-editor creates the impression that the divine name, the short form Yo, was known in Egypt. 
before Moses' flight to Midian. Remember the Kenite issue? Did they know, you know, did Moses know the name of Yahweh? Did, you know, did the, the Israelites, had they ever heard of Yahweh? And we said, yeah, you know, they, it's, it's entirely possible that they would have heard this name. You know, Moses, you know, it's a little, little more sketchy because, you know, he's, he leaves the house when he's weaned, two, three years old. He gets raised, you know, the son of Pharaoh's daughter and all that. But the notion that, that Israelites had never, you know, here we are back to Exodus 6.3 revealing himself to the patriarchs. Again, that verse does not have to be translated the way it usually is. But here we get you know, some either effort on the part of the writer or the editor to at least create the impression that Yahweh was known. So you can't just whip out all these Kenite verses, you know, these verses that talk about the Kenites, and you know, marry them to the archaeological stuff and just say, you know, talk about how late a development this was or how far in a development this was. Uh, again, that's a little sketchy. Because you really have to know when was this composed, again, the, the first draft, and when was it edited? Because the, the, the end product is certainly making a connection, certainly you know, operating on that assumption. It's interesting uh, in the verse, in verse 20, Aaron and Moses, let me read you the verse again. Amram took as his wife Yochavad, his father's sister, and she bore him Aaron and Moses. The Septuagint, Syriac versions, the Peshitta, and the Samaritan Pentateuch all add, quote, and their sister Miriam, unquote, so that it matches Numbers 26, 59, which reads, the name of Amram's wife was Yochved, the daughter of Levi, who was born to Levi in Egypt. And she bore, Am she bore to Amram Aaron and Moses and Miriam, her sister. So it's just kind of interesting. Um, you know, was Miriam deliberately not mentioned here, or did it get lost in, in transmission or, or whatever? Is, are, is, is the Septuagint and the Peshitta and the Samaritan Pentateuch, are they adding it in just for consistency? Again, who knows? And these are the kinds of things you run into. Verse 24 mentions the Korahites, the sons of Korah. And again, this is from Sarna as well. The Korahites observes Ibn Ezra, who's a you know, rabbinic commentator are mentioned on account of the statement in Numbers 26.11 that, quote, the sons of Korah did not die, unquote, in their father's rebellion against Moses and Aaron back in Numbers you know, 26. The Korahite clan later became a guild of temple singers to whom several psalms are attributed. They are also listed as having been guards of the threshold of the tabernacle and as performing other tasks such as baking and gatekeeping. A bowl inscribed with the sons of Korah, has been uncovered in an Israelite shrine at Arad, deriving from the 8th century BC. That's the 700s BC. So again, it's just an interesting note that the sons of Korah are mentioned here. And again, the, the, the idea is, you, you can say, let me just read you what Sarna says again. He says, uh, they're mentioned on account of the statement in Numbers 26.11. Now that assumes that the Exodus material is later the numbers 2611 in, in source critical terms. Um, you know, it, it could also, you don't have to make that assumption. You could just say an editor did that after the fact, again, to align the verses. You know, in, include information. But when I say align, I'm not talking about cheating, you know, like fixing errors in the text. What I'm talking about, even though an editor, a good editor, a good scribe, if, they, if he saw a problem, you know, could in theory do that. But a good editor is going to be, be looking at the mass of the Torah and for the sake of readers, that's the key thought. For the sake of readers, this is the, the guy or the guys who are responsible for, for producing the final form of the Torah. You know, we've talked about how editors will update place names and personal names and things like that. A good editor, for the sake of the reader, will do things like this. You know, they'll, they'll connect dots for the readers editorially and add words or, or you know, move things around or something like that for the sake of the story. So that, again, none of this argues f really for the, the JEDP idea as it's presented, but this is the kind of thing that for certain you've got editorial activity going on in the Torah. How that translates to who wrote what, when, and how much, I, I don't know. And, and frankly, neither does anybody else. Go down to verse 25, and our, our last note for the episode here, uh, we should mention Phineas. And that's the way most of us would pronounce this. Phineas or Pinchas in Hebrew. This name is also Egyptian. And it means the Nubian, the dark-skinned one. 
It was fairly common in Egypt in the 13th century BCE. So let me just read you know, where he shows up here. I'll read you the whole verse. Let's go back to verse 24. The sons of Korah, Asir, Elkanah, Aviasaf, these are the clans of the Korahites, Eliezer. Aaron's son took as his wife one of the daughters of Utiel, and she bore him Pinchas, Phinehas. These are the heads of the fathers' houses of the Levites by their clans. So this is an Egyptian name. This could be, again, uh, it's interesting. This guy winds up as one of the, the heads of the fathers' houses of the Levites. So this is a, a Levite, but he, it could be argued that he's a, he's a black guy. He's a, he, you know, this is maybe he's a, is, is he a native Egyptian? Like how does, and you say, well, how does that happen? Well, it, it happens with genetics. I mean, they could be intermarrying. This is pre-Mosaic legislation, all that kind of stuff. I mean, you're going to have people. And, and when we get to the Exodus, you know, we'll, we'll run across these phrases about how a mixed multitude came out of Egypt in the Exodus. You have people from other nations joining you know, by marriage or, you know, some, in theory, some other you know, means, just you know, they, males are going to have to be circumcised and all that. But you have people entering into Israel, entering into the people of God from the outside. Now, I don't know if this is the case. You, you could have uh, just a reference to dark skin without having the, the, the Negroid versus the, Carca the Caucasian issue, the Jew versus the Gentile issue. Who knows? It could be just a name just a, a characteristic or something like that, but it could be the result of a mixed marriage. And then it's like, well, no, wait a minute. You know, this is the tribe of Levi. Aren't they supposed to be like super, super duper clean and pure? Well, that becomes an issue after Levitical legislation. You don't have the Levitical Torah laws about marriage and intermarriage and all that stuff before there's a Torah. You know, I, I'm mentioning this again to say you have a mixed multitude coming out of Egypt. So this is a bit of a bit of a swipe, you know, on, on my part at at people I think who are more who are unreasonably obsessed with tracing their lineages back to the you know, Levites and, you know, DNA and what, you know, am, am I a, a secret Jew or this kind of Jew or that kind of Jew? Do I have Jewish blood? You have to realize before there was Levitical legislation, God didn't care. He didn't care. What he cares about is that if you want to join the people of God, then you worship Yahweh and no other. You enter into the nation, you take the sign of the covenant, which for men is circumcision. Women are to marry only circumcised males because that's the way you tell if they belong, if, if this marriage is legit. I mean, we talked about this in Exodus 4 with the bridegroom of blood, so, you know, sort of thing. I mean, they, they had at least that much of a sense of community wholeness and, and needing, again, to be loyal to the covenantal terms that God made with their forefather, Abraham. But you don't have a lot of this legislation and concern stuff. Now, once you make Aaron, once you bring Aaron, this is the chapter, you know, with the big genealogy, we just read you know, some of its features. Once you have Aaron brought into the picture, and that becomes the, the, the family and the line of the priesthood, and, you know, priestly duties. They're not all priests. You know, the, the, some of the Levites do other things, you know, associated with the religious objects and whatnot. But once you have that tribe demarcated in this way, then, you know, this stuff becomes uh, you know, more sort of tighter. There are more rules to follow. It's a bigger deal. But there's indication, again, in the Torah that prior to that time, that's just not an issue. You know, the, 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 the issue is, do you you know, worship Yahweh, the God of our fathers, or not. You're going to enter into the people of God or not. This is your identity now. So they're, they're going to, you know, the mixed multitude is not only going to be, quote unquote, pure Jews plus other, you know, riffraff. You're going to have that. You know, there, there's going to be people who glom on to it. You know, we, we know that from the Exodus narrative as well. But, you know, the, the whole mixed multitude thing could have something like this going on. Now, we don't know why Pinchas was given this name. Is, is it, you know, I hate to even use the word race because race is an artificial construct. You know, everybody's a human. But could this be a quote unquote, you know, racial, you know, issue, the result of a mixed marriage? It could, but it, it, it's fine. It's, it's legit. 
that, that this this guy is a Levite and the other Levites aren't dark skinned, but this one is, you know, it's not an issue because we don't have the same sort of parameters, the same sort of concerns and whatnot. And again, even afterward, uh, again, if you're if you, if you really want to be honest with it, that's kind of a, a misnomer anyway in the modern world because nobody can really trace their lineage you know, back to the tribes. Now, the, you know, the, the, the priests have tried this, the, the Kohen lineage. I mean, I, I get that. Uh, they've taken a whack at this, and there's a better case there, but that's one tribe. That's just one tribe. And if you've read the, the DNA stuff on, you know, related to Judaism and the Levites and all this kind of stuff, uh, it, it's far from a perfect picture. Let's just put it that way. It's a good shot, good look, you know, but it's far from a perfect picture. So I mention this again, that, that I just don't think that in real life, especially since we're not a theocracy and we are not under theocratic law and laws that concern themselves with tribes and lineages and so on and so forth. And, and we are never encouraged to try to find, you know, our, our, our tribal lineages and whatnot. And, and it, as if we could do that or, or to get some sort of honorary membership in some, in one of the Israelite tribes, you know, okay, if that makes you feel good, fine, but realize that's all it does. It has nothing to do with standing before God. Zero. And again, this is just something I've run into in Middle Earth. So I thought I would mention it. And Pincos, again, makes for an interesting discussion point in that sort of larger you know, area. But it's just not something that ought to be in the forefront of anybody's mind when it comes to you know, walking with the Lord. You know, what, what's my lineage? Am I really a Jew or something like that? Uh, it just doesn't matter. It didn't matter before the law, and it doesn't matter after the law. Again, after the theocratic system has been done away with, it was, it was initiated with the plan for it to be obsolescent at some point. The point being, when the nations are brought back into the family, under the Messiah, okay, this is planned obsolescence, this whole system. So I think we, we again, need to just think better about that and not let it be a distraction. So that's Exodus 5 and 6. Uh, I can't really tell you how far we'll get you know, beyond this point. Uh, it's, I mean, it's not going to be too long before we get into plagues and all that sort of stuff. I want to take some time and go through those you know, with, with some care. But that's Exodus 5 and 6, so we made some progress today. All right, Mike. Yes, we did. That's good. It's, uh, you know, we probably need to do a Q&A uh, episode here pretty soon, so maybe— uh, in the next week or two, we'll throw one of those. <laughs> yeah, in I'm there. not taking yeah. any questions on Exodus 3.1. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, so when we do do our Exodus Q&A, uh, chapter three is. I'll put a, put a graphic of a dead, somebody beating a dead horse. Okay. on. on hey, that's that actually episode. a good idea. That needs to be a good meme. If anybody wants to create a meme uh, with Mike being beating a dead horse. Yeah. I'll call it Exodus 3. I, it's dead. The horse is dead. So there we are. <laughs> All right. Sounds good. All right, Mike. Well, looking forward to next week. And just want to thank everybody for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. God bless. Thanks for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, visit www.nakedbibleblog.com. To learn more about Dr. Heiser's other websites and blogs, go to www.drmsh.com. 